Jeff, Jessica, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jim. We are really excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. I just thanks want to say I'm a big fan of your podcast because it delivers value-packed content um, and just great actionable steps you can take to improve your life, uh, your relationships, your business. So I love it. I'm a big fan. Ah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I, I, I'm a big fan of, of what you guys do. Uh, I've had you speak to my inner circle clients twice now, and there's so much value that they get out of it. And you guys are just like, you're so real and so good at what you do. Like I, 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 I should have had you on here a long time ago, but, uh, but, uh, best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. The, the second best time <laughs> is today. So we're doing it. <laughs> so I'm going to hit you with a big, broad question first, you know, when we get married, and most of this conversation is going to be in the context of of marriage, really, right? Mm -hmm. Significant others in, in in marriage, but like, you know, when we get married, we think like, okay, we're both in love, and everything should just be happily ever after from here on out. I mean, if we if we're in love, and, and we've kind of maybe been engaged for a while, and we know we're right for each other, everything should just be easy. I mean, right? I mean, why are why is that not the case? Why are relationships hard? Yeah, that's really, you know, what a lot of people call the the in love myth, right? You know, we think that if we're <laughs> in love, that it should just be easy. You know, if you've met the right person and you've fallen in love, then it's just sort of smooth sailing after that. But it's not, right? Relationships are hard and anything worth having in life you have to work at it, right? And it takes effort. You know, there are a lot of research has been done on relationship these days. I know you've referenced the Grant study before on your podcast, the, the Harvard study that has been going on for 80 years, you know, and what it's found is that, you know, the single best predictor of happiness and health over the longevity of our life is the quality of our relationships. But it takes work. It takes work to make relationships work. And, you know, despite having this knowledge about relationships, not just being sort of some aspect of life, but really being the key to life, despite knowing this, we spend so much time and effort pursuing other endeavors and enterprises that we think are going to bring us happiness, right? And we don't really invest the time that we should be investing into our relationships and especially our marriage, you know. Absolutely. And sacrifice can sound like a bad word, but it's really amazing that when we sacrifice for the things that matter most, we find such benefit. And so relationships are hard because I believe that they are literally a worthy and sacred struggle towards connection. I believe we are not meant to be alone. And yet that comes with a certain price and it's worth it though it's so worth it and even a time magazine article showed that when we are in a relationship we have better health we have better wealth we have better sex i mean and that's oftentimes something we don't think is congruent with a long standing marriage but it is and we want to just continue to unveil the 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 truth and and kind of brush away the myth that marriage is easy it's not it's hard but don't be discouraged because it is so worth it. It mm. is literally a worthy, sacred struggle that we can either choose to engage with for deeper connection, or we can choose to push away and try to self-protect. And so my passion would be that people really hear this and instead of being scared by it, they're encouraged mm -hmm. to say the reason it's hard is because it's real and it's gonna transform us in ways that we need to be transformed, but sometimes wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't choose it mm -hmm. otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, a survey of like over 700 older adults, you know, they all said um, almost unequivocally that the the best aspect of their life, you know, was having a long term marriage relationship. But they also all said unequivocally that marriage was either hard or very hard at certain um, points. At certain in their points. Marriage. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, but another reason I think marriages are hard and relationships are hard has a lot to do with our expectations. You know, we have such high expectations of our marriages these days. You know, marriages used to serve just some really basic functions. You know, we find someone to do life together, raise kids together and grow old together. And, you know, and that was about it. But now 
you know, because of, you know, maybe what we saw in our parents' relationship and we want something better, you know, because we don't want to settle, um, because we, you know, have seen the negative impact that divorce can have on our emotional well-being and financial well-being and things like that. You know, we really want to make sure, you know, we get it right and we've developed it, 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 it into a science. So we have all these, you know, matchmaking websites and all these tools, you know, we can use these days to find just the right partner. Um, but what also comes with that is we expect a lot more out of our marriage when we get married, whether we've used these tools or not, or, you know, we've just delayed marriage, which a lot of younger people are doing these days. They're delaying marriage until sort of like the optimal, you know, time. Um, but we go into marriage, I think, with much higher expectations. And we know, you know, our, our expectations going into any kind of enterprise has a significant impact on our level of satisfaction. I'm going to ask you a question that's sort of three parts, and it goes back to the grant study, really. If relationships are so key, uh, first of all, why? Like, do you have an idea of a, a philosophy on, on why? Like, why is it that relationships, is it maybe sort of, you know, ancestral or biological to us? Why is it that relationships are the thing that make us happy, number one? And number two, why do we pursue other things? Like, why do we think, oh, well, if I just make more money, if I get that promotion, you know what, if I buy that car, if I get the bigger house, like, why do we yeah. think that those are the things when, when they're just not? Like, research has proven it over and over again that those aren't the things. So, so again, why is it that, that relationships do make us happy and why do we still pursue other things? That, yeah, that's a great question. You want to start? I think relationships make us happy because at our core, we have a longing to be seen, to be known, and to be loved. And I know that's maybe more philosophical or spiritual, but I believe it's true. And relationships call out the fundamental reality that it is not what we do that makes us great. It is who we are. And relationships are the single place where we can find this ability to see ourselves. That's why marriage is so profoundly important because it's a quiet but beautiful place where we can reflect and be seen, where we can see and be seen, know and be known, love and be loved. And so it allows us for this sense of safety so that we can let down our guard, so that we can know ourselves in a way we never would have known ourselves otherwise. And I believe that makes us better people. I believe it makes us better entrepreneurs. It makes us better at our, you know, our daily tasks. It makes mm. us better people. And so relationships are foundational because they meet the core need of our heart, but they also reflect the core value of our being um, because it's saying you are important mm. to me. You are valued, not what you do, not who you know, not how you know amazing you are in these ways. We, we definitely can appreciate those things about the one we love. But at the end of the day, guess what? We need to know we're loved in the mess. We need to know we're loved when we don't have our stuff together. And I think that's one of the things that has brought me so much joy is to be seen by Jeff in ways that he is not happy with me. And yet he still loves me. He wants me to grow in ways, but he's also there and saying, I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And that gives me comfort to say I can be called out on my stuff and I can grow. But he's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And that is a comfort. And it also is a happiness because it helps me develop who I am as a person and recognize the true value um, of each other, knowing each other and loving each other well over a, a lifetime of change. And I would add to that, you know, one of the reasons, you know, a big reason why relationships are so important is because we're wired for a relationship. You know, we are wired to uh, attach and bond with other human beings. And, you know, as, as um, mammals, as human <laughs> beings, we, we require to be connected and attached and bonded to our primary caregivers much longer, you know, for our survival than, than any other creature on the planet. So we're really wired for this um, and relationships, you know, really are key to sustaining our lives in, in a number of ways. Um, and another reason I think that in knowing that, you know, we struggle, why, why do we still pursue these other things is what you asked is because it's sort of in the first question, right? Relationships are hard, you know, they're <laughs> not easy. We can't control them. You know, we can't 
control another person. So, you know, we spend a lot of time and energy and effort these days trying to optimize, optimize our health, optimize our performance, optimize our productivity. Well, guess what? You can't optimize another person. You know, <laughs> we don't have as much control over that. There are a lot of factors outside of our control when it comes to our relationships. So in some ways, you know, we as human beings, we like to be in control. So we want to pursue the things that we have control over that we think are going to bring us satisfaction and relationships are messy, you know, um, and we don't have control in that situation usually. But in learning how that works, it allows us to surrender so that in that relationship, we can change what is within our power. And so the reason we often run from relationships as well is we feel insecure, we feel vulnerable, we mm. don't know what to do because no one taught us. No one taught us how to dig in deeper and do the hard work of the relationship to gain the satisfaction that can come. So sometimes when we're dissatisfied and we're feeling invalidated, like, you know what? I'm not doing so well at home. Guess what? I'm doing really well at work or I'm doing really well on my mm. mountain bike or I'm doing really well, like, you know, doing these other things. I'm going to go do those things and just avoid the fact that I'm feeling insecure and um, unhappy with things going on at home. And our hope is that we can face those things things because there actually are inroad to what's going on with us. And instead of looking at how to fix it, we can just look at how to be with one another and how to be able to grow in that. And that's exciting to me because I do believe we will become literally our best selves in the depth of relationship when mm. we're doing the work because we're going to be transformed in that. And so don't hear me say that if you focus on your relationship, you won't accomplish those things. I think through the safety of your relationship, you will be launched into being the most successful person you can be. But it starts with connection. Um, and then it moves out into our ability to move into the world in a safe way, in, a, in an adventurous way, because we know we have a safe place to come back to. You mentioned sacrifice. And, you know, when we, when we, Think about the idea that, you know, we can control these other things, right? I can control what time I go to work in the morning. I can control how hard I work. I can control the degrees that I get. I can control the certifications or the whatever, like our health. You know, I can control the pills or the workouts or the whatever that I do. But relationships, that's, that's such, I had an epiphany when you explained it that way. It's like, gosh, that's it. Like you can't control the other person, but we want to, we want to control them and tell them, well, you're doing this wrong, or you should do it this way. And my way is better. And we feel that way. And it's like, oh, you keep that doesn't, doesn't work. Right. And Jessica, you mentioned sacrifice and this idea that, you know, we, we hesitate to, to say that word around relationships, but it's like, I, I, I think it's, it's true, right? Like, you, you do a hard workout and it's like, well, I'm sacrificing to, for my health. Well, are you sacrificing, but you're investing, whatever. Like we, we understand the language there, the, 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 what we're, what we're getting at. Like, so what is that sacrifice? I mean, wh what, what do you mean by sacrifice and what kind of things might you consider when you're, when you're trying to wrap your head around sacrificing or figuring out this thing that I can't control, that is the most important thing in my life, but I can't control it. Like, what are some things that I can start doing that the listeners can start doing to have an impact on that yeah. part of their life? How do we push life? that out? And, and I encourage people to start small, you know, because mm -hmm. <laughs> that sacrifice sounds like this huge, big word that feels really scary, right? But it can be something as simple as um, considering the us of the relationship. In other words, knowing that before I was married, there was me and I was making breakfast for one, right? But now it's a sense of, of seeing that I can make breakfast for two. It's a small sacrifice, but it's something I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the other person. I'm, I'm considering their needs in the moment instead of just considering my own. Now, it doesn't mean my needs aren't met too. Like I'm getting a great breakfast. I probably honestly am getting a better breakfast now that I'm married than I did when I wasn't married because I'm called to a higher standard. I'm like, I want to Ooh, I want to make quiche instead of just maybe eggs or something like that. And not that I have to do that every day. Goodness gracious stuff is, you know, not expecting that. But I love to do that. That's something simple and small that says there is an us here. Or running a special errand that you might not run for your mm -hmm. spouse because they're running behind that day. Or Jeff was running behind the other morning and I was like, you usually take the dog out. Please let me do it. And I'm so grateful he said yes. Those are small sacrifices. I had the time to do it. I had the energy to do it. And I just simply noticed. And so stop 
for a moment and just notice the things mm -hmm. that could make a big difference that go from me to we, that go from I to us. And that becomes a, a simple but significant sacrifice that says, I notice mm -hmm. and I care. And um, it can be major things like deciding you want to take a different vacation because uh, your spouse really wants something. But I find that that sacrifice actually becomes this giddy excitement, like, ooh, like maybe I can make it a surprise and plan something special. And, um, you know, it's kind of starts to get exciting. So it benefits you too, as, as the, as the giver, if you will, or the one who is sacrificing. Yeah. And I, you know, we have a saying, you know, before people fall out of love, they fall out of the practice of love. You know, so people don't just fall out of love like it just happens magically, right? We stop doing the things that we were doing in the beginning of the relationship when we were courting each other, when we were newly married. You know, a lot of these types of things came very easily for us. We wanted to do things for our partner. You know, we wanted to make those sacrifices. We wanted to show them, you know, our best selves. Um, I have a friend that says, no, when you're dating, you should show your partner your worst self <laughs> so right away and get it out of the way. And that's how you're going to know if you're compatible or not. But uh, but we don't do that. We want to show them our best selves in the beginning. Um, and then after we've been married for a while, you know, we kind of we, we, we stop doing those things. You know, we get complacent we take each other for granted. Um, we get sort of wrapped up in our own in our own world, our own jobs and careers and our needs. And we just stop making those little sacrifices that can make a really big difference. But you guys, you guys have this figured out because you're both marriage coaches. So this is you guys understand this. You understand everything we've talked about. You're helping me have epiphanies like you guys have nailed this. It's perfect in your world, though, right? Absolutely not. <laughs> we are tell us about the struggles or failures. I mean, we talk about success through failure. I mean, yes. tell us about tell us about yeah. your world, how how this you know uh, how, how, yeah, how we your fell. relationship has evolved and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, we, we fail all the time. You should probably tell you I fail more often than, than she does. No, that's no. not true. That's not true. <laughs> but yeah, we, no, we make mistakes. I remember when we first um, got married, we were driving around with our real estate agent, you know, right before we got married, looking for a home. And, you know, he found out we were both mental health professionals. And, you know, he said something similar. So well, you guys, you know, must have it figured out. This marriage <laughs> must just be easy for you. And we just laughed because like, no, we have to work at it just like everyone else does. We have our our shortcomings. We have our triggers. You know, we get upset, you know, and we have to do the same things everyone else does. You know, we have to be intentional. Um, we have to make sacrifices for one another. Um, we have to repair, you know, and apologize, you know, when we when we make mistakes. And so to speak to that element of um, failure and then finding that it is actually our our avenue to success is that that is so much of what marriage is, is it's it's recognizing again, I have a mm. safe place to mess up like I can be safe and bring out all the stuff all the mess, so to speak, from you know the closet and just lay it out there and say, okay, what are we dealing with here? And when we can be non-judgmental and supportive and caring, and not that we're that way 100% of the time, like we have to apologize for that too, for being critical sometimes or for being you know, impatient or not listening. Um, but I think it's so true that I have the same journey as someone else. It's gonna have a little bit different junk I'm hauling out of the closet, but it's the mm -hmm. same idea, the same thing. We all have it. And if we are gonna allow for transformation, we have to allow for deep relationship. And marriage is one of the best opportunities for that lifelong um, knowing and, and relationship so that we can change and grow. And we have to be humble though. I mean, there's a lot of um, humility and the way to foster humility is to recognize that your true value, that you are beyond compare. You are irreplaceable. The person sitting next to you in your marriage is an irreplaceable miracle. At the same time, they're a human being who makes mistakes. And when we know that, we can say, you know what? I did make a mistake there. And it's actually unveiling my pathway to do it differently because it's showing me what I need that I didn't get, or it's showing me what I need that I need to do differently next time. And so it's literally our our, our, our pathway, if you will, it's, it's kind of like getting the map. Um, so that next time we know how to go, which way to go, how to avoid some of the pitfalls. And that's what we love to do in our own marriage and, and, and support others in understanding, um, how to make it easier over time that the mistakes mm -hmm. and failures actually give us the roadmap to 
to navigate it better as mm -hmm. we move forward. So I'm, I'm thankful for the mistakes, not in the moment. It doesn't feel good. I'm thankful for the failures um, because they do show me what, what I really need and how I can move forward. Yeah, we all have our cycle. You know, if you've been married for a while, you know that when you have a disagreement with your spouse, it tends to follow a very predictable pattern, right? <laughs> you fall into this cycle and it, regardless of what the content is, it usually goes the same way and ends the same way, you know, and uh, we call it our self-protection cycle and we, we fall into it. We still fall into it. You know, sometimes yeah. we're able to avoid it and sort of you know, cut it off, you know, at the head before it starts. But a lot of times we fall into it and we have to sort of recognize that we're in it and, and work ourselves out of it. You know. but what is the self-protection cycle? Sorry, Jessica, and you can you no, go ahead and finish no, your thought. No. I want to hear about the self-protection cycle. Not too. at yeah, all. The ahead. hope is just that it does get better. Just for mm -hmm. everyone out there, like we have been working at it and it gets better. It gets easier. Your cycles can become a little bit shorter. And that's the hope mm -hmm. that it doesn't just stay the same no matter what you're growing and you're maturing. But that's a great question. Mm -hmm. The self-protection cycle is important to identify. It's, it's really identifying when we have been triggered into instead of authentically connecting through just being ourselves, we're actually engaging in self-protection. So mm -hmm. our fear brain has engaged and we are technically in something called fight or flight. And so it's very common to understand it biologically, um, mm -hmm. but it's very seldom applied to relationships and marriage. And so it's really fascinating when we understand that we have often been triggered into this place of fight or flight, and we're not really even thinking clearly. <laughs> we're mm -hmm. actually just engaging in self-protection. Now, why is this important to know? It's important for me to know that if Jeff is fighting me or running from me, that something in my higher functioning brain can actually turn on and I can say, you know what? He's he's been triggered here. Something has been happening. So when mm -hmm. we identify the trigger, we recognize that the person is not attacking us intentionally. They're trying to protect themselves. So that's why we call it the self-protection cycle, mm -hmm. because it's not, it appears to be an attack, but it's really trying to protect yourself from either rejection or disconnection that you're experiencing in the mm -hmm. relationship. And so that is just an epiphany that allows us to draw closer to each other. Um, and also to recognize, gosh, I really have to be aware of my self-protection because it mm -hmm. can really communicate some negative things. If I'm attacking someone, if I'm withdrawing, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm fighting or fleeing, it's going to, you know, communicate, I don't like you. I don't want to be in a relationship with you. So we have to identify what's our trigger, what's our behavior, and then what's the other person's response to that. And then what's mm -hmm. their behavior. So we're really then unveiling the ability to move from self-protection to then opening up to more authentic connection. Jeff, you mentioned that we're mammals, we're wired mm -hmm. like this. And Jessica, you alluded to this as well. Like, I understand there's, there's neuroscience behind this. Like, what mm -hmm. is the neuroscience that's going on behind this? Yeah. So we talk about it in terms of, you know, we are born, you know, with a, a drive to connect and a drive to protect. Right. And sometimes these things are, are when they're working together, it's great. Right. So the drive to connect is the is attachment you know the that we're wired for deep bonding and deep attachment with other human beings the drive to protect is our our autonomic nervous system you know the the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system that gets activated by the limbic system you know it's the driver of all of this and it's fully functioning at birth right so our limbic system tunes us in to cues of danger and cues of safety. When we feel safe, we want to move towards something. When we feel there is danger or where we feel there's a threat, we want to move away from it. So again, when these systems are working together, when we feel safe, when we feel secure, when we feel our needs are adequately met and are going to be met, then we move toward, we're able to connect with other people um and connect with our spouse however when we feel threatened you know when we feel like our needs our fundamental needs uh, for love for belonging and even physical needs are not going to be met um when we feel you know there's danger or threat present um then our our that fight or flight or, or flee response you know um gets activated and we move away we shut down or we attack you know in return yeah 
And one of the reasons that's so profoundly impactful is because it's also, as you mentioned, Jim, it's biological. And so our mm -hmm. whole bodies can become flooded mm -hmm. with cortisol, which is that stress hormone with norepinephrine, with epinephrine, you know, with these like adrenaline where we are feeling just like panicked and on mm -hmm. high alert. And sometimes because of or angry anger, yeah. you know, sometimes yeah. that's what comes up for us because um, we're always like trying to protect and anger is a emotion rising up to protect us from something. Right. And so we're going to fight when we're angry. And so this idea that, um, that it rises up in us, we're going to feel like something's really wrong. Something's really wrong. And that sometimes is, is not a total accurate representation of what's happening in the moment. Sometimes we've been triggered from something in the past that says, Oh gosh, I know this is not a safe experience mm -hmm. when it may be very well. It's, it's, technically safe, but for us, it's not. And so that's why it becomes so complex and it's important to slow it down. But this is the beauty is that we can begin to understand for our unique specific spouse, what has triggered them and mm -hmm. what's going on. We can understand their history. And so this is another point where we say, oh, I failed there. I, I overreacted to that. No, you didn't. You actually reacted in a way that helps unveil pain from the past so that your spouse can know you more so that you can be better understood. And they can say, oh, wow, yeah, that makes so much sense. That would scare you. I'm going to work on not raising my voice quite so much because I understand maybe mm -hmm. that happened in your past and that's really triggering for you. So in understanding the cycle, we actually can create greater safety and show that sacrificial care to say, I want to change so that it's a safer environment for you. I want to make this um, slight adjustment so that uh, maybe in the situation in the future, not quite as triggered. And then that just brings a sense of love and care. Like Jeff was saying, it actually increases that sense of safety you have with the other person because you know when I share with them, they're really going to seek to understand and care and even make literal adjustments in their behavior so that we can have a safer, healthier, happier connection in our life. I've heard you guys talk about this story that I really think ties all of this together, <laughs> all of the <laughs> concepts that we're talking about. I've heard you tell the nail clipper story. And I think this is just a perfect example of how all of this can play out in the real world. Can mm -hmm. you share that story? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's a funny story. So, you know, we start off this story, you know, just by saying it's not about the fingernail clippers, you know, and the idea behind that is most of the time in our relationships and our marriages, we're arguing about things that that don't really matter. We're arguing about surface things that have triggered us or upset us in some way. And what we're not understanding is is the process. We're not understanding the cycle that's going on that we're falling into. So, you know, this is a story about, you know, me, I like things, you know, to be organized in a certain way. I like to know where to find things, you know. Um, so when I go to a certain place and I open up a, the medicine cabinet or the, or the drawer, you know, I want to know I can find what I'm looking for. And one of those things are fingernail clippers. And so I keep them in a certain place in our bathroom in the medicine cabinet. And every once in a while, you know, I go in there and, um, you know, they would, they wouldn't be there. Jessica had taken them out to use them for something and they didn't get put back, back in their place. Jessica, you know, is more of a creative type <laughs> and, you know, she, you know, and then there's nothing wrong with that, you know, so sometimes she puts things in different places. But I had asked her a few times, I was like, you know, could you please, you know, when you're done with the fingernail clippers, put them back in the same place just because I, you know, I went, went to go find them and I didn't find them. And then, you know, on this particular day, I go in there and, you know, the fingernail clip clippers weren't in there and I got a little irritated and I spoke to her in an irritated tone about it. You know, my request was a little irritated, you know, and then she got triggered, right? You know, she felt, you know, criticized. Um, she felt my tone, you know, was, was critical being critical of her. And so, you know, she responds in, in her sort of self-protective way, which is to become defensive, typically sort of defend herself, which is a natural response. And then when she responds defensively, that shuts me down further. You know, when I feel she is responding def um, defensively or getting upset with me, then I respond by sort of shutting down and moving away from that you know and you know we are familiar enough with our cycle to sort of kind of know like my tendency is to sort of withdraw a little bit more and shut down um and but what we, you know as we unpack that 
and you know we had to sort of like talk about it more and and talk about the reasons for that you know and sort of looked at you know well why was this upsetting to you and why does this bother you and as we kind of talk through that a little bit and are able to identify some of the things you know some of the reasons behind that um and some of the things that sort of create this sense of sort of chaos you know a sense of sort of chaos it feels unsafe to me you know when i when some things aren't as predictable as i'd like them to be and that goes back to some of my childhood and the, and the way that i grew up you know so without going too deep there the what it does is when you're actually able to sort of identify the cycle and identify what's going on and identify sort of some of the underlying reasons for why you respond the way you do that helps to create greater empathy in your spouse. So when I was able to sort of put my finger on it and we were able to sort of talk through it, then Jessica was able to say, oh my gosh, you know, you're not just being a jerk because, you know, I didn't put the fingernail clippers back in the same place, you know, where you expect them to be. She's like, I understand why, what that, what that triggers for you and why it upsets you. And, and I don't want you to feel that way, you know? So it creates just a greater and deeper understanding of one another. It, allows for deeper connection with one another and deeper intimacy with one another as you're as you make yourself more vulnerable um and i recognize that my defensiveness is no. really about wanting to show how much i do care and that there mm. were three different fingernail clippers in there it just the very one he wanted i didn't know that was the one he wanted right so i'm defensive like no i do you know i do care i do want it to be good i don't want it to be cat i'm trying really hard like i can't keep i can't keep track of everything all the time i don't know <laughs> you know but it's communicating that his needs can't be met in the situation and so when we can break it down and he can recognize it's not his needs i'm pushing against it's feeling mm -hmm. criticized that i'm pushing against you mm -hmm. know it's not his you know needs that i don't care about then what love can flow from that is what we call the safety cycle, which begins to unpack the self-protection and recognize, no, mm. I care so deeply about your needs that I want so much to have it, you know, neat and clean, but I'm not always going to be able to. And so how do we do this differently? How can he present his request in a way that said, I know mm -hmm. you're trying, this is really still irritating to me. And then I can be humble and just really say, you're right. You know what? They, they were actually in my purse, to be honest with you. I had taking them for something else for <laughs> we've gone on trip or something and never put them back, which is very typical me. Um, so this is this process where I can accept myself and accept my creative side and that I'm probably never going to be quite as organized as, as Jeff is right. But that his gift also can benefit me that I can also validate his needs and that we can grow closer together and begin to begin to see how this heals us, how this helps us validate our needs and that he's not bad for making these requests or needing these things that I care and that we can come together on it, even if I probably will lose or not have them back in the right place in the future. <laughs> no, we're going to deal with it differently, but um, I'm still going to try. I'm still going to still going to work on it. And I'm going to try to present it <laughs> less aggressively <laughs> when I'm upset, right? It's a work it's in really progress. really cathartic. It's really <laughs> cathartic for me to hear this story because I am wired so much like you, Jeff, and my wife, Allie, is wired so much like you, Jessica. Case in point, I couldn't find my deodorant for the past 24 hours. Like my deodorant, I can't possibly understand where, how it could leave the one spot that I place it every day. I think Allie actually might have used it yesterday, and I found it in my daughter's bedroom on her desk. I'm like, how could it possibly i know my girls didn't take it in here ali probably was using it and then like got distracted and like had to you know hurry up and handle something in the girls room and set it down and but i but i just i want the listeners to know like scenario. it comments and it happens to everybody right yeah <laughs> but i do want the listeners to know like this is normal like these little things that that blow up into you know massive marital you know divisions like this is normal and you have to work on it like you have to do something you can't just assume that it's going to get better right and and you can't also assume i can't go i can't go to alley and be like don't ever take my deodorant again and move it out of the spot like that that doesn't that doesn't work right as you guys just just talked about there are things that you can do there are habits that you can do like so i'm curious jeff and jessica like what are, are there any habits that you guys have done over the years yourselves or habits that you 
coach your clients through the greatest marriage ever that you coach them to do? Any types of things that, that help people be successful? Well, you know, one of the things, you know, we, we coach people on is, you know, just a little bit about what we talked about. It's, it's making sacrifices and, and just practicing kindness. You know, John Gottman is, is famous for his research in marriage and, and what he came up with, with was the five to one positivity ratio, right? So because we as humans tend to have a negativity bias, negative t- negative events and things stick with us uh, more than positive ones. They stick to our memory more um, than positive events do. You know, the positive interactions in your relationship need to outweigh the negative interactions in your relationship by a ratio of five to one for a successful, happy marriage. All right. So anything below five, you know, if the re- if the ratio is even and certainly if it's inverse, you're not going to feel very happy in that relationship. So, you know, practicing basic kindness, again, going back to practicing some of those things that you do in the beginning of your relationship, because you want to create as much positive sentiment in the relationship as possible. So we have you know, a five day connection challenge. And, you know, that's all about just sort of like five simple exercises you can do, um, like practicing gratitude and, and sharing with one another positive memories, um, things like that, that can create more positivity and more positive sentiment in your relationship. Yeah. And for example, one of the things that you mentioned when you are in that place of frustration, when you're feeling like um, something's going on here and I'm just really bothered by it, it is really important to slow down that cycle. And that's another Mm -hmm. thing to, if you're in that place where you feel like, well, we're doing all the appreciation, we're doing all the gratitude, and we're still getting stuck on this, you know, this this cycle of fight or flight, the cycle Mm -hmm. of self-protection. It's really good to slow that down and really unveil that, to really slow that down and say, okay, what was I feeling when I was feeling triggered. Like, I'm just not important to her. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a point where you stop and say, okay, that is something we want to talk about. I want to sit down with my wife and say, hey, I'm not feeling important. And um, and, and so that's a a conversation that can unveil, hey, Mm. what would you need from me in order to feel that way? Because I care about you and I want you to feel important in my life. And so that's a really good exercise too, is Mm -hmm. just to say, what do you need from me? When someone comes to you with something, practice humility and to say, I'm here. I love you. I do care. I do want you to feel like your needs matter, like your success is important to me, or like your things, you know, can be put back where they belong. And, um, and so that, that apology, that humility, but also that, that, what can I do? Because mm-hmm. we need to see our, our, our beloved, our spouse, you know, our significant other sacrificing, as we talked about at the beginning, that we bring that back around, um, to say your needs matter. And I do want to, to help you feel more mm-hmm. secure, or safe, or, or loved in this relationship. Yeah, that's what we what we do in our work with couples is we really help them um, identify and unpack their cycle. You know, the specific responses, the reasons for those responses, what their their core sort of needs are um, in these interactions and in these moments, and then giving them the tools to be able to sort of slow that down and communicate their needs more effectively to one another. It's interesting. You mentioned the five to one ratio that John Gottman discovered. Uh, There's an organization called the Positive Coaching Alliance. This is helps youth sports coaches coach young athletes. And they talk about the five to one ratio of positives to constructive criticism as well. There's just something magical about that number. And it's, it's hard. It's hard to get to five, right? But, but if you can really focus on building up those positives, then, you know, the, the negatives are, you know, you want to minimize those, but you can, you know, those are going to be there. They're going to be the challenges that just come up, but you've got to really build up the positives. And I also want to highlight for the listener, you know, you talk about habits, like you talked to, you know, you, you just, Jessica, you mentioned, you know, asking the question, what was I feeling? You know, what was I feeling in that moment? And then sitting down with your spouse and asking the question, like, what do you need from me? And th- that's a productive pause. Like this is, you know, this, this, productive pause that I talk so much about on the show, this is the secret to success. It's, it's, I define it as a short period of focused reflection around specific questions that leads to clarity of action 
and peace of mind, clarity of action, and peace of mind. Okay, what do I need to do? And okay, I know I'm doing the right thing and, and being able to put your head on the pillow at night knowing that that you're doing the right things. And so I encourage the listeners to to not just listen to this episode and and go, okay, uh, good ideas. And then, you know, go on with your day as it might've otherwise gone on. Actually think about, you know, what you were feeling in that last conflict, right? Might've been just this morning or in the last 24 hours and then sitting down with your spouse and just having a conversation, asking questions about that. Um, so I, I appreciate you guys pointing out some, some real habits that people can do. Um, and, and I'll ask you this, how about an action item? Like my listeners like to have an action item, something they can do in the next 24 to 48 hours. And maybe you've already shared it. Maybe it's that sitting down with your spouse, but mm -hmm. one thing that you can recommend people could do in the next 24 to 48 hours to start taking what you've taught us here today and applying it to their relationships. Well, I would encourage them to go and sign up for our, our free five day connection challenge, because that's going to give you five action <laughs> items, real simple you know, 10, 15 minutes a day, things that you can do to start creating more connection and positivity in your relationship, especially if that has felt like it's been lacking, or if you just want to some really basic, simple tools for improving that aspect in your relationship. For the listeners, I will say that I've, I've been through the five day challenge and it's amazing. It's simple. You might say, oh, I'm too busy. And like, I got enough emails. Not like this. Number one, we've already identified, like, this is the most important thing in your life. And number two, this is simple and actionable. So I do, I, I, I recommend that as well. So we'll have a link to that, by the way, in the action plan, go to jimharsherjr.com slash action. I'll have the link to that and everything else from this episode, but go ahead, Jeff, you were going to say something else. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, a real simple thing that's a part of that is, is practicing gratitude. You know, we talk about that, you know, in so many aspects of our life and it's really important to apply that to our relationship as well, you know, so just sit down, you know, and write out three things about your spouse or partner that you're really thankful for, that you're grateful for, and then sit down, you know, take about five or 10 minutes to sit down and share those with each other. Excellent. You guys, amazing. We're going to have to do this again sometime because there's so much more to unpack here. But for now, where can the listeners go to find you, follow you, learn more about your program, your, your relationship coaching, et cetera? So they can find us on uh, www.greatestmarriageever.com. Um, they can sign up for the connection challenge there. They can learn more about our coaching services and a little bit more about what we do. We have a blog. They can subscribe to our, our email list and subscribe to our blog. So those are the best ways to, to get connected with us. And we would love to hear from you. Excellent. For the listeners, again, if you can't remember all those links and places to go, just go to jimharsherjr.com slash action or go to greatestmarriageever.com. Jeff, Jessica, you are doing so much good in the world. Thank you for what you do. And thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having us, Jim. Thank you so much, Jim.